All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. The Lord has made known His salvation. From the gradual this morning and from the gospel we know, His name was called Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, King and Center of all hearts, have mercy on us. Sacred Heart of Jesus, in whom dwelleth the fullness of divinity, have mercy on us. Words from the Litany of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Why, we ask again, why did Christ come at Christmas? Among many reasons, among the top reasons, to glorify God. To bring glory to God. Also to ensure that God is perfectly known and loved in His creation. That could only be accomplished through a hypostatic union, and He came down from heaven for us men in our salvation. He came to save us, thus the name Jesus, which means Savior. But how did He actually carry out this most vital work of salvation? We've been discussing. There's no one particular way that covers all the bases, And so there are seven. So far, we've covered six of the seven ways he did this by way of satisfaction of God's justice, by way of word and example. He showed us how to get to heaven. That's the pedagogical way. By way of buying us back from slavery to sin and the devil with the price being paid with his very own life blood, that's redemption or transactional way, by way of sacrifice of himself as priest and victim on behalf of sinful man to God the Father. So by way of sacrifice, and by way of merit, by way of meriting superabundant graces for us to overcome every possible defect and obstacle. As a result, nothing can be used as an excuse for getting between us and heaven. No act of virtue, no kind of death is too arduous, too painful for the saints because Christ has merited every possibility. There's no exceptions. We can't say, oh, it's too hard. No, it's not. And finally, by way of recapitulation in which the new Adam gathers in himself all of mankind, as it were, in creation, in order to perfect it and reconcile it to the Father, such that all things can be restored in Christ, as St. Paul says. Those are the six ways we've covered so far, and this brings us to the seventh way of how Christ saved us, namely, what has been called the physical way. Physical because it has to do with the body, the flesh, that God came down and took upon himself, assumed a human nature, even the flesh of man. Physical. Now recall that in order for recapitulation to work, there must be a unity of nature between us, between all of mankind, and Adam. He is our father such that we all share in his sin. As St. Paul says in Romans, we all sinned in Adam. So we share in his sin. He's our father. There has to be unity in order for a recapitulation to work. But there's also a unity required between our nature and that of our Savior, his majesty, who takes away our sin. The fathers had a saying, what is not taken up by Christ It's not redeemed by Christ. So he had to take up the whole man. The unity between his majesty and the human race is so intimate, so perfect, that the salvation of the whole human being as an individual, as well as all human beings as a species, becomes possible. But on the other hand, we know all men are not saved. All are not healed, and that there is an eternal hell. And sad to say, it is teeming with damned human souls and demons. Now, this doctrinal truth is from the gospel and the teaching of the church. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The physical way, let's look into this. The physical way of salvation is expressed by the fathers of the church 
such as Athanasius, Gregory of Nyssa, Cyril, Hilary, and Victorinus, among other saints. Now, according to these fathers, Christ our Lord, in assuming a human nature in His incarnation, He affected all humans, all human nature. Not just His own. Because of this intimate association of our humanity with the divinity in the second person, human nature is somehow divinized. A number of the fathers say God became man that we might become God. In the Roman breviary, we find this famous antiphon in the laws and vespers for the octave day of Christmas, Od admirabile commercium, O wondrous interchange, the creator of the human race taking unto himself or unto himself a living body, deigns to be born of a virgin, and becoming man from no human seed, hath bestowed upon us his divinity, hath bestowed upon us his divinity. Interesting. Antiphon from the Roman breviary. Listen to St. Athanasius express this. He says, Through this union of the immortal Son of God with our human nature, all men were clothed with incorruption in the promise of the resurrection. For the solidarity of mankind is such that by virtue of the words indwelling in a single human body, the corruption which goes with death has lost its power over all. Again, for the solidarity of mankind is such that by virtue of the words indwelling in a single human body, the corruption which goes with death has lost its power over all. You know how it is when some great king enters a large city and dwells in one of his houses. Because of his dwelling in that single house, the whole city is honored, and enemies and robbers cease to molest it. Even so it is with the king of all. He has come into our country and dwelt in one body midst the many, and in consequence, the designs of the enemy against mankind have been foiled, and the corruption of death, which formerly held them in his power, has simply ceased to be. St. Athanasius, from his work on the Incarnation. Now, there are a couple of places in the Scriptures used to support this physical way of salvation. Most notably, the passages found in St. John's Gospel, where it says, you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's St. John 14, but also St. John 17. That they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, and you and me. Now, commenting on these, St. Thomas Aquinas writes, Hillary gives this exposition, and you and me, that is, you will be in me through your nature, which I have taken on. For in taking on our nature, he took us all on. St. Hilary. Cornelius Lapid reports that St. Cyril says much the same. Quote, that you may be in me through union of substance. For since I have assumed human flesh and substance, I have united the whole nature of man and as it were all men to myself. End quote. Now, one thing that becomes more apparent from this way of understanding Christ's saving work is just how evil Practices such as embryonic research and cloning really are. If our human nature has been assumed by the Son of God, then one wonders how long we will be allowed to tinker with it. For it, since His Majesty assumed our nature, then such matters are even greater offenses to God had He not done so. But strictly interpreted, 
this physical way of salvation would render superfluous any other work of his majesty apart from his incarnation. Everybody would be divinized just from the incarnation alone. That would be enough. But it is not strictly taken by the fathers, but rather is always considered in conjunction with one or more of the other ways. Now just think about it. Everybody dies. And their bodies decay. We have graveyards. Clearly, these bodies were not divinized. This comes later. It's part of the glorious mysteries. Yet to be fulfilled, we have hints of it in the, in the incorruptible saints. You can see they've been divinized to a certain degree. They're not rotting. But it's not complete yet. So this means there must be some blockages to divinization. And this is why we need the other ways to help us see how Christ saves us. You cannot take one by itself or you'll end in heresy. And what I'm building up to is that the modernists have chosen this way of salvation as the way. Well, we look at what St. Peter teaches us in his second letter. He says, this divinization is not automatic but that it is connected to the promises of Christ and may come about if we cooperate in living a virtuous life. 2 Peter chapter 1. Thus he says, we may, may be made partakers of the divine nature. At every Mass, the priest mingles the water with the wine at the offertory. He prays, grant that by the mystery of this water and wine, we may be made partakers of his divinity who vouchsafe to become partaker in our humanity. What is more, St. Paul teaches in Ephesians that we were by nature children of wrath. In other words, when we were conceived in the womb and born, we were children of wrath. And this is remedied by way of baptism, by the application of the divinizing effects of Christ to the sacraments. They begin to work on us as individuals. It's not an automatic thing, a conception. So just as Christ has won for the whole human race satisfaction for God's justice for all sins of all time, just as he's bought us back from slavery to sin and the devil, for all men, the whole world is redeemed, so to speak, bought back. It says it right in St. John's first letter. Just as Christ won superabundant graces to overcome all trials, obstacles, and every painful death for all time and places, so too the same is true of his divinization of our human nature. It is available to the whole human race, but only to those who cooperate with a saving work will receive its full effect. Just as the human race originating in Adam and Eve suffers from original sin and its effects, so too Christ, the Lord, the Savior, the new Adam, won for the whole human race the ability of being divinized. But most men, sad to say, say no. They fail to respond. To put it another way, objectively, by assuming our nature, our Lord redeemed, he sanctified, and even divinized the human race in himself. But his saving graces must be still applied in space and time to subjects of salvation. That's us. Individual men, if they be cooperative and willing. So in a universal sense, yes, Christ has sanctified and divinized the human race in recapitulating all things in himself. In a particular sense, no, Christ has not sanctified each human being inasmuch as these individuals refuse to submit to his saving graces, his saving ways. But he is ever willing to enter into these individuals and recapitulate his life in them to make them holy. We can think of it like this. Our Lord won the war, but is still fighting individual battles for souls and in souls until the end of time. Let us be counted among his victories, and we will share in the spoils. 
a fully glorified, divinized humanity. And we'll take up the errors that flow from this physical theory when taken by itself tomorrow. Sacred heart of Jesus, King and center of all hearts, have mercy on us. Sacred heart of Jesus, in whom dwelleth the fullness of divinity, have mercy on us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.